or good morning. And we're very excited to bring you the first session of our latest webinar series, Scientific Computing Infrastructure for Life Sciences. Uh, if you have any questions during the webinar today, uh, please try to use the Q&A feature. We have a lot of attendees, so um, raising hands and then live questions may not be possible, but post in the q and I'll be in there to answer questions and we may bring some of them back up for our answer at the end. <clears throat> so today's speaker is uh, Dr. Ari Berman. Um, Ari is the CEO of BioTeam. Uh, he's an expert in scientific computing, specializing in high-performance computing, high-performance networks, data centers, storage, cloud, general IT infrastructure, bioinformatics, and data analytics. Ari has designed, built, and, <clears throat> and operated scientific computing environments for 26 years. <clears throat> His PhD is in molecular biology with a focus on neuroscience, which helps him to advocate for science and empower researchers to make discoveries from their complex data sets. His goal is to help create a dynamic abstraction of flexible infrastructure for research end users and to enable anyone to analyze and gain knowledge from complex data sets. So today, Ari is going to be discussing the central problem of cloud versus on-premises architecture for life sciences. And with that, I'll pass it over to Ari. Awesome. Thanks, Adam. And uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. It's, uh, it's good to see a lot of familiar uh, names in the in the virtual audience here and uh, appreciate you taking some time out. Hopefully this will be uh, interesting and uh, perhaps a little provocative. So um, I'll get my uh, my screen share going. Um, and uh, as Adam said, he'll uh, uh, he'll be sort of following the chat and uh, uh, there's, there'll hopefully be some time at the end uh, where uh, we can address some of those questions. So we'll get going. So as uh, Adam said, uh, uh, the title and the uh, subject of this talk is cloud versus on-premises architectures for life sciences. And it's the first of, uh, of a few talks in this webinar series by, uh, by BioTeam. So what are we talking about today? Uh, it's clouds, uh, life science research and biomedicine have been sort of faced with a choice in scientific computing and that's sort of cloud or no cloud. And it's driven essentially by massive data production. So uh, if we spend a little time here setting up what that problem is and why organizations are faced with those decisions, uh, if, if, and we back out to the big, big picture of the world, um, data generation in the world, not just in sciences, is at an all time high. There's an estimated 98 zettabytes of total data collected to date. If you don't know what a zettabyte is, uh, it's a, a zettabyte is a thousand exabytes, which is a thousand petabytes, which is a thousand terabytes. You might know what a terabyte is, uh, or most people might. Uh, most of your laptops have about a terabyte of, of storage on it. So it's an enormous amount of data. And if you break that down, um, just last year in 2021, uh, 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 an estimated 26 zettabytes of data were generated. That's about 10 and a half gigabytes per person per day. It's an enormous amount of data. When we focus on uh, science itself, uh, life sciences especially, uh, this, this level of data generation is uh, high as well. And the reality is that you need a lot of infrastructure in order to move, store, analyze and share the data. And this problem uh, specifically in life sciences is continuing to grow for lots of reasons. Uh, if you've seen my talks before, I often use this slide. Uh, the reality is, is that uh, life sciences at the moment is among the top data generators in all of the sciences. Uh, it's pretty close, I think, to uh, astronomy and high energy physics, if not uh, surpassing, simply because of the parallelism of the number of laboratory instruments that are distributed across all the labs in the world uh, and, and the diagnostic centers in the world that can generate tens of terabytes of data per week. Uh, some of these things you know, can generate you know, five terabytes of data in you know, a few hours. Um, and uh, you know, sequencers, which are, are genomic sequencers, you see a picture of one there in the middle on the right, uh, those, those types of devices uh, can run 24 seven and just produce huge amounts of data. The reality is that the data that these machines produce uh, really can't be analyzed easily on your laptop or your office desktop. And so they really require advanced computing to be used. Things like high performance computing, super computing, uh, um, you know, scalable computing environments. Uh, as a result and uh, the, of the sophistication needed in order to uh, look through this stuff, bioinformatics and data science have taken over the biomedical analytics space. You really can't do modern research without uh, uh, those types of toolings. And it requires a high amount of of uh, computational sophistication to move forward with that. So what happens essentially is there's a struggle really to find storage and compute power. Uh, 
And just the reality is that uh, most lab scientists spend about half their time figuring out where to even store their data. Um, uh, and you know, without the right support, they make choices like you see on the right here. These are pictures that we've taken over the years uh, from, from some of our clients. Uh, the real famous one on the bottom there uh, is that that's 25 years of laboratory data uh, sitting right under a chemical shower in a lab. It's, it's not a good choice, um, but uh, uh, things happen like this if there's not enough support. And then when you move to the uh, more sophisticated users, the, the bioinformaticians and life scientists, they spend about 80% of their time just cleaning data up so that you can even analyze it uh, in the context of other data uh, due to the lack of data standards in, in, uh, in our space. Uh, most organizations have some sort of uh, high performance computing or storage um, uh, available for their uh, their organization. And when they don't, they uh, they usually provide something in order to, to move these things forward. Uh, but a lot of times, if you're using on-premises uh, equipment, it makes it really hard to collaborate uh, with, with outside groups. And almost everyone does do collaboration these days because of the size of the analytics and the diversity of skills needed to uh, make sense of it. Um, and large organizations, they need to store hundreds of petabytes of data, and you know uh, some of them are approaching exabytes of data, and then they need to analyze it. And the intersection of big data and AI and uh, machine learning have forced sort of this starvation for uh, storage and compute. Now, I said the two buzzwords, and since I said the two buzzwords, I have buzzword slides. So there's this is the big data slide because no talk in the past, if you look backwards, was complete without a big data slide. Um, everyone's talking about big data. And when what is big data? We never really defined it. Uh, the bottom line is that it was the ability to store and access large amounts of data, uh, which led to uh, the information age, a ton of data being generated. Uh, everyone started generating a lot of data. There was nowhere to put it and even less clue how to analyze it. Uh, and that led to sort of the, the, the data science revolution in life sciences and led to advancements in AI. Okay, so now for the next buzzword, here's my AI slide, because no talk is complete without an AI slide. Uh, let's be honest, it's a remarkable field. There's a lot of really great stuff happening in it. It is very, uh, has a lot of promise, uh, but it is super overhyped, hyped, uh, reminiscent of big data. Most people don't really understand what AI and machine learning is. Most people think it means this. For those that don't know, that's a reference from the Terminator series. Um, but it's not really. Um, and uh, one, one of my friends and uh, old colleagues, Jay Bosso, uh, said once that uh, most computer scientists who really understand this, uh, think of AI as the stuff we can't program a computer to do. If we could, it's not AI. Uh, and so if we can program a computer to do it, it's probably not what, what we're considering actual artificial intelligence. So let's talk a little bit about AI because it's a big driver in the discussion today. It's super useful, but way overhyped. And the, the, uh, the king of the hype industry is the Gartner uh, hype curve analyses. And so this is their most recent hype curve on uh, artificial intelligence. And if you take some time to look at this, it's actually really interesting. Uh, where you want to be <clears throat> uh, eventually with any technology is on the plateau of productivity. That means it's, it's in, in production, it's used all the time, it's it's sort of made it into the mainstream, uh, et cetera. And there, there are bits of this that are close to that. Um, but uh, the reality is that uh, if you look at the peak of inflated expectations uh, and the drop down to the trough of disillusionment, um, though that's where most of our uh, uh, world of AI uh, and ML is today. And, you know, as a computer science discipline, AI has a whole bunch of subcategories. Um, and when you look at what that is, and when most people say AI ML, they're talking about one small uh, bit of artificial intelligence, and that's at the very top there, deep learning or, uh, or deep neural networks. And there's all these other great and very interesting and very useful parts of this field, all of which are being used, but most people mean deep learning when uh, they're talking about uh, AI these days. And it's, it's just one of many machine learning types even. There's a whole bunch of other ones and it's not suited to all problems. Now, if you, if you look at uh, you know, the, the parts of the, ch the hype curve that are in the trough of disillusionment or on the slope of enlightenment, uh, semantic search is, is sort of becoming a real thing where you can search for uh, contextual terms and get results out of that. Computer vision is something that's been uh, driven a whole lot by the thing that's right behind it, autonomous vehicles. Um, and uh, you know, that has a, a, 
a triangle on it, which means autonomous vehicles are still more than 10 years away from really being there. And then chatbots, chatbots. We love chatbots. They're, they're, they're doing great right now, but everything else is sort of behind that curve. And so when you think about uh, productivity in life sciences and AI, it's two to five years away, really. Um, worth doing, but it's driving a lot of computing. And um, I love sort of um, using this quote uh, and using it in various contexts, but where we are right now is that AI is kind of like teenage sex. Everyone talks about it. No one really knows uh, uh, how to do it. Everyone thinks everyone else is doing it. So everyone claims they're doing it. And that's that's where we are today. The interesting thing about all of this <clears throat> is that uh, we've transitioned away from the information age, the collection of data to the analytics age, where we actually have to gain value uh, from the collected data. And uh, that needs a lot of IT infrastructure. And this AI revolution really put pressure on IT, especially in, in science organizations, uh, to deliver really good solutions. And uh, there, in this transition and uh, the, the rapid development of laboratory equipment, uh, what life sciences com computing needs has changed. And that life sciences research in the 21st century uh, requires computation as a laboratory tool. So the data center has essentially become a laboratory tool, just like a, micro, a, a microscope or a sequencer or uh, you know a plate reader uh, in a laboratory. You really cannot do modern modern science uh, without advanced computing of some sort. And so that really changes uh, uh, the scope of things. So with that background, um, what what happened and has led to uh, this particular conversation is that the pandemic uh, uh, really changed the game. What happened was everybody went home into isolation. Labs shut down uh, and uh, researchers uh, said, hey, you know what? I've got all this backlog data. Maybe I should start analyzing that since I can't go into the lab and make new data. Uh, let's start making sense of the old data. And what happened was uh, very quickly, on-premises HPC and compute systems uh, really ramped up their usage a whole lot. Um, and uh, it was it was such that there, there were users that didn't use that, that equipment very often, uh, were suddenly clamoring for access and hours on systems, and the systems weren't large enough, um, and there wasn't enough support necessarily to, uh, uh, to, to really accommodate all that work. And so... Um, and what also happened because of the pandemic, due to supply chain issues uh, from uh, COVID-19 taking out uh, people and, uh, and development of, of um, uh, goods to consume, um, on-premises uh, infrastructure became more expensive and it was super hard to manage remotely. There were, uh, uh, because of the pandemic, you know, many people weren't going into the data center except when they absolutely needed to, to do things and uh, mostly working from home. And so, uh, you know, slow delivery uh, to keep up with demand and uh, local IT was barely maintaining the status quo. And that's still true. There are still supply chain issues and there's still parts of uh, technology that are super, super expensive. So. What happened was cloud providers launched a brilliant marketing campaign. They took advantage of the situation, and it was a really good choice, actually, uh, to do that in this environment. Um, is that suddenly, you know, look, you want you want compute? It's available in the cloud. Uh, come come use the cloud, and so they convinced the decision makers really to go to the cloud. The problem here is is sort of a problem with humanity in general, and this is that people tend to think in absolutes. Uh, a solution can be only this or that. If we're going to the cloud, then we're going to do all cloud. And let's abandon things that work well, because this will be better. Um, and reasons that uh, we're going to do this. Everyone's doing it. It's cool. So people will invest in it and support it. And leadership likes to talk about it. You know, look back to the teenage sex quote, right? It, it's, it's about selling what you're doing. Uh, and uh, that's important. The reality is that it's a very nuanced situation. There are no absolutes. And this is not simple at all. So the rest of the talk, we'll talk about this. What happened was there was an aggressive cloud migration program uh, started in almost li every life sciences uh, organization that I know of and, and many other ones uh, where all future planning uh, was for cloud first or all cloud infrastructures uh, and uh, transitioning away from the local infrastructure. People started talking about closing their data centers and uh, you know uh, reducing their on-prem staff and uh, those sorts of things. Uh, in order to help facilitate this, cloud providers gave deep discounts and a lot of direct uh, support during the planning and migrations of the cloud. And uh, local organizations really stopped planning on local infrastructure at all, uh, storage, HPC, and even networking, uh, which is uh, a little counterintuitive given that you have to move the data still to the cloud. 
Um, and so all future planning was really for cloud-based ar architectures. And uh, here at BioTeam, we've seen this movie before. And so a quick look back, the last wave of cloud migrations. Uh, back in 2008 uh, to 2014, we helped several organizations migrate completely to the cloud and close their data centers. At the time, uh, AWS was really the only game in town. Um, and so that's, that's where we went. The draw was cheap, easier to manage, endless supply of compute power, and the the uh, uh, the thought that you needed less staff, and basically the total cost of ownership was lower, um, and that there was better shared access for external collaborations. That's true, and still very true, and better access to public data sets. That's still true, and 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 is a really good uh, use. The reality, however, is that uh, it turned it didn't save people money. That was that was something they thought was going to happen. It ended up being ten to fifty times the cost of operating your own data centers, and uh, it turned out that the cloud offerings couldn't replace all the local infrastructure. Um, and to use it required very specialized skill sets in IT. Uh, it was essentially harder to use for a lot of reasons. And ultimately, uh, in science organizations, it didn't really meet scientists' requirement. And so the result was what um, uh, I think, Adam, you you, you coined to this cloud sobriety. Um, and uh, it, it, you know, people sort of sobered up to uh, the cloud idea, and there was a massive pullback. Uh, of course, absolutionism still applied, and everyone went completely out of the cloud and just went back to their data centers. Um, and it turns out what short memories we have, because now it's happening again, but for slightly different reasons. Those reasons still apply. Um, the, and the, the situation is quite a lot different now than it was back then, in which there are more cloud providers. Uh, the clouds are way more sophisticated. Uh, the clouds are largely designed to hand, handle true enterprise needs now. And that's something that wasn't true back then. You really had to work hard to get uh, uh, the cloud to, to solve large enterprise needs. Competition among the clouds has forced huge innovation in the services. And there's aspects of the cloud that you, you, you cannot reproduce locally. There's things that, that they just do better. Uh, deep learning applications, specialized hardware services are huge draws uh, because it, it makes it uh, a lot easier to do that type of work. Um, <clears throat> and there's so much data now that storing it locally is pretty non-trivial and takes up a lot of a lot of space and a lot of time and a lot of money. Um, and but however, you know, it's happening again because we hear it again. There's this promise of it being somehow cheaper to operate in the cloud than locally. Um, and so additionally, you know, the flexibility of cloud architectures, and I said this before, combined with the supply chain. Uh, supply chain issues uh, made moving in that direction more attractive for a lot of organizations uh, for very good reasons. And so, you know, if we have a uh, more sobering discussion, you know, sort of the birds and the bees or uh, the birds in the clouds, um, the truth is, you know, cloud is super dynamic. It's quick to set up, almost unlimited sca uh, scaling. And we uh, do a ton of work in the cloud and we're really supportive of the cloud. However, it's not a replacement for your data center. Uh, it is actually someone else's data center with a weird access model that requires a credit card. Um, it, persistent anything in a cloud is super expensive, um, uh, even if you use their proprietary services. Um, and uh, using their proprietary services is really the only way to make it less expensive. Um, or using it uh, very smartly. And the truth is there's a huge last mile problem. Um, getting back to the networking comment earlier, uh, you need to get your data to the cloud and back. So if you're going to de-invest in your local data centers and invest in clouds, you still need effective, robust networking to get your data to and from the cloud. Uh, and it requires super specialized skill sets uh, uh, in order to use uh, uh, the cloud effectively. And most scientists don't have them. So. Also, um, the cloud business model really locks your data and operations into their platforms. And I'm quoting uh, someone else uh, here, but uh, they called it the most successful ransom scheme in history. Uh, you're, it's you know, free to put data in, uh, but you're charged to get it out. Uh, the only way to save money is by using proprietary and very useful services like serverless architectures, you know, bulk operation services, um, uh, you know, Lambda uh, functions, you know, and specific analytics services that really make it a lot easier to approach uh, uh, you know, very complex types of architectures. However, uh, using these things locks you into using their services and it's re you cannot reproduce them yourselves. And this is both a good and a bad example uh, depending on how you look at it, but uh, the social media platform Parler experienced this uh, early on uh, when uh, AWS kicked them off their service. Uh, the, the way that they uh, architected their system made it so that th it just didn't work anywhere else. They had to start from scratch and re-engineer it. And that's, that's sort of what happens. And this is one of the reasons why you get locked in. 
So let's talk back to uh, science specifically. What are, here are some relevant questions, you know, to cloud or not to cloud, that's the question. Uh, you know, first of all, can you do real HPC in the cloud? Because for a long time you couldn't, but yes, now you can. Uh, you know, some of the clouds, you know, um, especially Azure, uh, AWS, you know, they really have true abilities to do HPC now, but it really depends on what kind you need. You know, not all HPC and not all applications are created equal there. Um, can you create a secure environment in the cloud? That's one of the real big questions, especially with, uh, you know, uh, controlled access data and uh, proprietary uh, uh, data, like from pharmas and, and so on. Uh, absolutely, but it's real easy to mess up. Um, and the models of security are really different than on-prem uh, architectures. Can scientists use it out of the box? This is something that I think most IT and leadership misses. Absolutely not. They cannot use it out of the box. Uh, it requires setup of services, um, the creation of user user interfaces, the uh, the uh, you know creation or uh, uh, instantiation of of uh, specialized platforms. If those aren't there already, scientists cannot use it out of the box. And even the most sophisticated users, people who have a ton of cloud expertise, they need to architect their environments before they can really use it. Sometimes it's fast, but sometimes it's not. Uh, there are some things there out of the box, but they're pretty basic and they're meant to be cobbled together into whatever service you need. Can you use it for storage? Absolutely. But storage in the cloud is super complex. Uh, it's actually more complex than on-premises, which is uh, hard to imagine. Um, it's really hard to figure out how much it's going to cost to do things there, and it's super easy to overdo. And as I said earlier, once your data is in the cloud, it costs money to get it out again. So let's talk about why you should use the cloud. I think most people get this, but um, the the biggest uh, uh, draw is that it's got huge capacity. They uh, they all um, advertise you know, essentially infinite scaling. That's not actually true, but it's it's way bigger than you could ever make. Um, uh, automatic upgrades. You know, if you're running on an old machine, you know, you essentially turn it off and then turn it back on again, and you're on a newer architecture. Um, and uh, there's there's reliability that you just it's really hard to do with your own architectures unless you own multiple data centers across multiple states or multiple uh, uh, localities. Um, you have virtual orchestration and serverless, serverless technologies. You can really create super sophisticated environments uh, way more easily in the cloud than you can uh, uh, locally. Um, you, you know, the uh, containerization and portability of workloads is, is something that was really um, refined and is used a lot in the cloud. Um, and while that is uh, making its way in, into local data centers, um, uh, it's, it works much better in most of the clouds. Um, you can share data way more easily because it's just more accessible and you can uh, create more sophisticated ways of sharing data and collaborating. Um, because there's shared standards and architecture in any particular cloud, it's a great way to set up prototypes and to test new ways of doing uh, various things. And one of the big uh, draws is the avail availability of accelerators like GPUs, because uh, the, the clouds probably have more GPUs than anyone else. Um, although if you really try to use them, it turns out they aren't so available, or at least they weren't uh, uh, when I when I made the slide up about a month ago. Uh, mostly because uh, you know the, the the crypto bros were were taking up a lot of them, and uh, you know it's 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 hard to grab them. So um, you know. Uh, Another advantage is, you know, specialized services. Um, you know, there's services that you can just use and it does all the super complex stuff. Um, and as long as you use it correctly, it, it makes it really easy to, to do uh, a really complex thing. So really great advantages of the cloud. So why wouldn't you go all cloud? And this is me getting, uh, you know, much more fundamental to how is cloud compatible and not compatible with science? And the reality is <clears throat> that, there's a fundamental mismatch between the cloud business model and long-term research goals. What is not clear to folks is that these are private for-profit companies. They are not public utilities, even though they sort of come across like that. And because they're not public utilities, they offer services that they can change at any point, and they do change them. And when you think about the life cycle of, of, uh, of scientific studies, the, the shortest scientific study is five to 10 years. Uh, in almost all, all cases. And some longitudinal studies are hundreds of years long. Um, and, you know, if if you're putting stuff in a cloud or a service that can change at any point, you know, what's the durability of your data uh, uh, in, in those timeframes? And, you know, the really interesting thing is, and I actually read through all the terms and conditions of all the three major clouds, they don't disclose even a time period uh, that they that you get if they shut down to get your data back. 
and this should concern you. Now, sure, clouds are too big to fail, whatever. Um, I get it. But what if they choose to do something different? What if they choose to uh, not offer a service? What if they give you a year and you have 50 petabytes of data in the cloud? Uh, deploying 50 petabytes of, of storage on, on, a, on a floor in a data center is going to take a long time. It's going to be super expensive. And then you have to transfer it all. And depending on, uh, you know, uh, the, the egress charges, et cetera, it's going to be real hard to get that data back. And so this is yet, yet again one way how it, how it locks you in. Um, going with more of a hybrid computing model starts to preserve data ownership. Um, and keeps your source of truth locally and also makes it so that you can optimize how you use clouds, uh, both monetarily and uh, and uh, uh, operationally. So you can copy data to the cloud for analysis from local. So if you really invest in, uh, you know, good data transfer technologies and uh, and good networking, um, you know, you can get data to it for free, essentially, unless you have uh, direct connect. Um, but and then once you've done the analysis, you delete that data because you already have a copy of it uh, on premises. And then you copy the results back of, of the analysis and uh, and it minimizes the data egress fees because usually the results are small. And, you know, any expansion of data during the analyses, you know, happens on the cloud and you can uh, you can just discard it. So if you really think about um, what well, so now to really think about how you can do uh, uh, hybrid cloud environments, you have to understand, you know, what are the computing requirements for life sciences? And this is super, super overgeneralized. Um, but, you know, the reality is that 50 to 60 percent of the computational need in life sciences is, is sort of batch capacity, single threaded computing. A lot of genomics, statistics, inference, you know, these these types of things that just need uh, you know, computers essentially to crank through nothing sophisticated, but there is a lot of data um, and, you know, uh, speed does matter. Um, that's the largest uh, bit of the need there. Classical parallel multi-threaded HPC workloads, uh, things like simulations, large model fitting, phylogenetics, uh, those sorts of things. It's, it's 20 to 30 percent of the need. And those, those things are huge, huge workloads and really require specific architectures to do very well. And then, you know, the real capability stuff, the real high, highly specialized workloads, and I, I think I'm exaggerating a little here, somewhere between 15 and 30%, depending on the organization of, of, of computing need are these things. Things like, you know, deep learning training, while it is going on all over the place, it's still pretty specialized. Data lake processing, you know, there are a lot of data lakes out there right now. Um, so maybe that's closer to 30%. You know, train, inference, simulate workloads and natural language applications. Those are, those are sort of the main uh, foci there. And so what's the problem? If 50 to 60% of the workloads are simple batch type jobs and less than 30% of the jobs are exotic or need specialized hardware, what, what, it, what it turns out to, to mean is that a smaller number of users require specialized hardware. And usually a smaller number of users use up most of the GPU, CPU storage than any of the other users. There's sort of a, a, a high short um, a burst of, of users that use most of the, uh, most of the infrastructure available because uh, they're doing the big stuff. And there's a whole long tail of users that don't use as much. Um, and it turns out that it's uh, neither cost effective nor good for the scientists to go all cloud for scientific computing. And uh, I'll explain why in a minute, but uh, and I'm, I'm quoting uh, Chris Dagg um, on this, but you know, cloud should never be used as a cost play. It should be used as a capability play. If you need more capabilities, absolutely go to the cloud. And there's, there's great reasons to do that. But if you think you're gonna save money, you're not. And this is the biggest uh, mistake most organizations make. So our, my argument today, our argument is that scientific computing really needs hybrid solutions. You still need local systems. There's a lot of reasons for that. It's easier for scientists. It's easier for security and IT. Uh, and uh, you have <clears throat> more direct and customized support. People, people know the people uh, that, they're, that they're working with and, and uh, can, can support their needs more, more directly. Um, Cost-effective on-premises storage and computing is possible. If you really target building these things for things that are going to be used about 80% of the time or above, uh, you're going to do way better with on-premises stuff than you are in the cloud. And, uh, you know, I say this a little bit later, but uh, the, if, you, if you target this, it kind of allows you to build smaller local uh, uh, systems 
uh, because you can use, uh, you know, expand into the cloud for that other stuff. At the Texas Advanced Computing Center, which is one of the uh, uh, larger uh, NSF uh, supercomputing centers in the United States, uh, they did this calculation that said that their services are one eleventh the cost of uh, cloud for HPC and storage, and they, they did sort of an actual apples to apples comparison there of their supercomputers versus using those in, in uh, I think AWS was the target. Um, if you build local HPC and storage and staff it well with both cloud and HPC expertise, uh, uh, the skill sets and scientists, you know, um, you, you can really support the science that that's going on much, much better. Uh, staffing is really critical. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a little counterintuitive, but most scientific computing applications in life sciences and biomedicine are made for the most sophisticated users. And a lot of the laboratory folks who need to do these analyses can't do them themselves the way that they're implemented. Um, and this is a whole other discussion to have, but um, you know, it kind of creates a bottleneck for scientific analysis. Um, so if you create a true hybrid environment uh, and you know, do things like put the same applications in the cloud as local and make the data avail available to both, um, then you can you can really um, you know, make a very dynamic and very uh, uh, high capability type of environment that can handle a lot of needs. Um, the truth is that we really need to adopt cloud-like methodologies, automations into the data center, uh, because that's a big draw of the cloud to, to be able to have infrastructure as code and um, you know have abstracted services that you can just use. Um, I think the cloud has driven uh, what's possible in IT forward quite a lot. Um, and some of these are starting to make it back to the data center, but I think more of it uh, uh, should make it back. So when you're really thinking about it, what goes where? Uh, uh, and on-premises versus the cloud. Um, and a simple way to break this down is essentially, you know, uh, local HPC storage data platforms, uh, you know, put the most common batch and capacity workloads on-premises. Um, you know, put jobs that people don't mind waiting in the queue for, uh, things that, you know, just need to crank through, uh, but, and uh, they don't mind waiting. Um, you know, manageable but long-running workloads. If you're, if you're doing some of these, uh, you know, molecular dynamic simulations that can run for six months on architectures, um, that's going to get super expensive in a cloud to run constantly for six months. It might be better to have it set up so that you can do it locally. Um, and you know, if you store all of your primary data locally and maybe archive to the cloud and move it when needed, uh, you're going to really balance out uh, uh, the needs of the organization and keep your source of truth local. Um, cloud-based large but rare workloads should go to the cloud. If you've got one group that needs to use 100,000 cores of, of, of uh, CPU power for a week, you shouldn't build a system uh, that has 100,000 cores locally so they can use it for one week a year to use it in the cloud. Um, really exotic computing needed re really specialized hardware, use the cloud for that. They have it. Um, and uh, unless you're doing it a whole lot, it doesn't make sense to have it on, on premises. Uh, experimental workloads, things that you're just trying out, things that regularly blow away local compute systems, um, you know, set it up in a cloud workload um, because, uh, you know, uh, the only, the blast radius that that's going to affect is just going to be uh, uh, that user. And, and uh, treat local like a production system and uh, test in the cloud. Um, that's that's a really good uh, use case. And you know there are lots of things that should be production in cloud as well, by the way. But um, you know just as a general rule, if you uh, if a local IT group treats it like that, it works well. Um, and you know I think I said this kind of already, but if you create a hybrid support team, uh, you can help with both environments in one group. And I, I, I think that's really critical. Take a real holistic approach to this. It's not cloud or on-premises, it's both sort of in one support team. So there are uh, some fundamental things that are needed to make this work. Um, and one of which is changing how we think about uh, the main, the main uh, the main unit of, of, of work that, that uh, we're talking about here, and that's data. So really, if you think about it, uh, um, you know, the, the currency here is data. Um, you're in a data supply chain, to, to quote what uh, uh, Stan Gloss, one of our founders, says a lot now. Um, but if you really organize everything in a more data-centric model, um, where infrastructure and services are organized around the data uh, versus the, organize, the data organized around the infrastructure, um, then you can really um, uh, create an environment that's truly hybrid. <clears throat> a lot of the HPC centers actually do this uh, with their multiple systems. Um, 
it, so uh, another word for this is kind of, it is also called a data cluster. Um, these things can be very sophisticated or very simple. Uh, the main point is that data is really the center of gravity uh, for all services. It allows for the distribution of services, both to local and remote cloud-based infrastructures, um, and makes it way more flexible what you can uh, plug into where uh, in, in, in the data environment. A little more blown out view of this, um, uh, which is uh, generalized from a study that we did specifically at one of our clients, um, that there's a lot to this, but you can imagine if everything connects into a core data providing system of some sort, right? Where the source of truth for scientific data uh, is on that, it's backed up, There's there, it's tightly coupled with multiple computing resources um, uh, and abstracted services, et cetera. Um, then you can plug all sorts of things into it. You can have your own HPCs. Um, you can have, uh, you know, a regulated HPC environment for controlled access data. Uh, you can have uh, capability HP HPC, so things that are very specific uh, to do uh, very, very hard workloads. Uh, you can plug the cloud resources right into it. You know, you can uh, do data management independently. Uh, and uh, you can have multiple data storage resources in this, in this data cluster. Um, so this is a relatively new concept. Uh, you know, there's, there's not a lot of folks doing this really great. Uh, and, you know, we spent a lot of time uh, consulting on, uh, you know, data management strategies and, uh, and uh, you know, data, data storage resource strategies to, to start to get towards this. And there's, there's a lot of ways to do it and a whole lot of ways not to do it. Um, but, but thinking about it this way changes what you can do quite a lot. And it, uh, quite frankly, it makes it easier to invest in architectures that are going to work uh, attached to the, to the data cluster. So uh, final slide here. Um, you know, why hybrid? The reality is it's about the science, not the technology. Uh, you know, the, the focus should be really on what capabilities does an organization need that are going to support the science. And, you know, don't focus so much on cost and uh, be lured in by, by marketing buzzwords. The cost is uh, important. It's, it's super important. You have to be able to support it. But uh, but uh, the marketing groups often overhype things and and don't tell you the whole truth about how much things cost. Um, and as we've gone through here, the reality of the situation is super nuanced. Um, but and, and if you really create a hybrid environment, you can create a very effective data ecosystem uh, for your organization or for multiple organizations. And as I said earlier, with hybrid, you can build smaller locally uh, and have a great support team for the scientists um, and only build what will be used the most. Uh, everything else goes into the cloud or an external provider, say an HPC center that uh, that provides that sort of thing. Um, and it achieves capability expansion. And if you do this right, also cost effectiveness, because at the end of the day, the point of the organization is to accomplish their scientific mission. And so if you have the right uh, scientific computing capabilities available, that mission is gonna move forward much more easily. Um, again, if you do this right, uh, uh, scalability, resiliency, and uh, and the primary data gravity are still within your organization's control, which uh, which makes durability a whole lot better in case you know some of the services that you're using happen to go away. Uh, you've got a backup. You've got a um, you know a way to go uh, forward. The big caveat here is that no one's doing this well yet. Um, a lot of this is kind of aspirational. So what this really is, is kind of a, a, a call to arms to, you know, let's make this happen. Let's let's put this type of thing together. Um, we've been talking about it as long as I've been at Bioteam, which is 10 years now. Um, and uh, But I think the technologies exist and the sophistication exists to truly be able to do it now. So with that, I will stop and thank you all very much for listening. And uh, I'll turn it over to Adam, who can, who I think has been watching the chat. And if you have any questions, you know, yep. post it in the chat, and uh, uh, we'll I'll try to try to answer them. Thank you very much. Awesome, thanks, Ari. Yeah, and we do have a few questions that came in. Uh, one of the most common question was, uh, can we have these slides uh, afterwards? So the answer is yes. We'll be sharing the slides out uh, immediately after the webinar, probably on our on our website. Um, and also we have, let's see, we had a hand up from John Nathod. I was gonna give him a chance up, hands down. John, did you still have your question? We could go with a live question. If not, I'll go to the, all right, John disappeared. So, um, all right, so we have a question from uh, Eric Doyle. He said, it's often said in real estate that it's all about location, location, location. So what are the two to three most important characteristics of a cloud provider as I evaluate various cloud offerings if I'm focusing on long running data intensive HPC applications? Oh, that's a complicated question. Um, and lots of nuances. So 
Um, I think the first thing you have to start with is what are the problems you're trying to solve, right? Scientifically, or what what's what are you trying to do? What are the characteristics of uh, of your need? So really do a, a, a careful, um, you know, careful requirements gathering that that is kind of science based, and then uh, look at the various capabilities of the clouds because you know at a real fundamental level, if you're just doing um, instances and uh, and uh, you know basic storage, the clouds are all pretty much the same. They they quibble over pennies um, uh, for for uh, uh, various offerings, but each of the clouds has their own specialized offerings uh, that uh, that you know, something they're good at that the others aren't. Um, and, you know, for instance, like Microsoft Azure, they have an entire class of true HPC systems, you know, uh, you know, Cray supercomputers sitting on the floor of their data centers that you can actually use. And so depending on uh, what you're talking about, if you've got long running data intensive HPC apps, like for, for instance, you know, those long running um, uh, simulation type applications, you know, maybe it's cost effective to do it there, especially if they're big and you're doing it a lot. And maybe you can work out, um, you know, deals with the cloud to, to make that work. Uh, and it also depends on, you know, how much data you have. And so what I would look at are what are the requirements? What are the uh, the profiles of the software? I can stop sharing here. Um, what are the profiles of the software that uh, that you're 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 using and what are the capabilities you need to do it and then evaluate um, the, the, each of the cloud environments to see, okay, so which one covers this best and then start looking at cost. Um, and that should be the last thing you're looking at, but it should be considered. Uh, how much is it going to cost to do this? And then I think you can evaluate, does it make sense actually just to build part of this or all of it locally? Um, or um, is there a way to do it uh, in the cloud cost more cost effectively? Uh, I would say those are the two to three most important things. I don't know. Adam, do you agree? You're You're the... More yeah, no, I agree. And so some of the things I might look for, like Ari said, do they have true, you know, HPC instance types, right? So can you get sort of, you know, the fast CPUs and GPUs in there? Um, do they have some high performance networking technology? So some cloud providers have InfiniBand and other sort of fast networking, um, you know, can they sort of um, put your instances close together for sort of, you know, latency sensitive HPC applications, right? You don't want your instances to kind of spread around the data center. So do they have capabilities to kind of keep things close together on the rack, I would say. So for a lot of applications, that's going to matter. Um, and have they figured, do they have a high performance storage offering? You know, are you going to be able to sort of read and write to your storage um, once you have, you know, thousands and thousands of instances running? I think not all cloud providers are providing that. Um, and then of course the cost. So do they have um, something like a spot market, right? Where you could take advantage of unused cycles and maybe do some of these long running jobs at a time when they have spare capacity and you can get it at a discount. Those are the kind of things I would think about if I was going to do a true HPC in the cloud. And when I talk about our upcoming webinars, we actually have some two dedicated webinars on, on doing HPC and AWS uh, using parallel cluster, which I'll, which I'll talk about in, in a few minutes. Great. All right. Uh, okay, so we got a few more coming in. Uh, let's see, another one um, from Clarence Wang. Do service providers like Ignite have any way to compensate for risk and stability of cloud providers offerings? Hmm. Um, <clears throat> I think it depends. Uh, certainly, they 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 do have uh, some of that. Um, <clears throat> I'm not as familiar with Ignite. Do you know it better, Adam? Um, it's I know yeah, I know Chris bit. Dag has has <laughs> done some look into this one, but um, yeah, one thing I'm familiar with is that you know they they they're really their their marketing I guess can get um, a little ahead of them where they don't really have good support for for Linux, right? And they don't they haven't really thought through some of the uh, more sort of scientific computing use cases. So I'd say you know be a bit cautious in terms of how they compensate for risk and stability. Um, again, I think you'd have to look at your you know service agreements and like Ari said, you know maybe sort of having all in on one cloud provider is a real risk. And so definitely evaluate that for your business, right? What's what's going to be the business impact if your cloud provider goes away or has significant downtime or outages? Um, and how they compensate you. Yeah, I don't know if that sounds like a, a contract uh, kind of thing. Yeah. Well, then I'll, I'll add this. Um, uh, the answer is not doing the same thing in lots of clouds. Uh, you know, if, if you are doing multi-cloud, multi-cloud means you're using each cloud for the capabilities that they're the best at. Not that you're trying to do the same thing across clouds because you need multiple providers. That's that's kind of insane the way clouds are put together. So, um, you know, I, I think the real, you know, again, the whole point of this talk is, you know, let's think about hybrid ways of doing things. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, can something like Ignite help 
with uh, with balancing on premises and remote architectures? I I, I think so. Um, but uh, again, I don't know a ton about that particular one. All right, <clears throat> here's a good one for you. All right, it seems to me that data management solution is key. Uh, any recommendations? <laughs> okay, um, <clears throat> so data management is hard. Um, any of you trying to do it right now knows know that it's hard, um, and it's hard for lots of reasons. And so there's this is not a again a simple answer. There there are a number of uh, you know data management platforms out there, <clears throat> and it also depends on. Are, are you looking at platforms for science and or enterprise or just, you know, basic business needs? Uh, the, the answer changes a lot between those things. Um, and so uh, I would say that, uh, <clears throat> you know, if you're, if you're dealing with pure scientific data, uh, one of the best things to do is to create abstraction layers between uh, the underlying um, uh, architectures and the end users and using things like data commons platforms are a good way to do that. And there's a lot of them, um, you know, open source ones like gen three, uh, that, that we've implemented a few times, things like, uh, uh, seven bridges or Terra, um, our, our, our great architectures, uh, you know, Palantir foundry, um, is, is used and liked by a lot of folks. And it's very, very, uh, uh dynamic data bricks, you know, there, there's a whole bunch of different architectures that you can use, uh, for various layers of data management. Um, the, the key, however, is that in order to use data management, well, you have to adjust the culture of your organization to, to start using it. Right. Um, in general, scientists are not incentivized at all to uh, use use data standards or to use common, say, metadata describing their data um, or or to uh, utilize specific data models. They want the freedom to create whatever data structure they want uh, for their uh, 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 their data analyses. And that that creates um, you know, sort of a, a really difficult environment to work in. Um, these data commons or, or uh, data platforms can can really help with that. Uh, some of the data ingest is is automated um, and and uh, can can put it in particular formats so that it can be used together. Um, you know, uh, ways of associating the data together, like data dictionaries and indices, um, uh, and uh, you know, graph architectures can can really help move those things together. Um, and each of the uh, environments that I just talked about, I think, has uh, some aspect of all of those things. Do any of them do it perfectly? Absolutely not. Um, is there a perfect solution? Definitely not. Um, culture is the biggest barrier here, though, I would say. Hopefully that answers the question. That's great. <clears throat> um, so from Adam Marco, um, how much are customers concerned about power or heat considerations on-prem? Yeah. Hey, Adam, good to hear from you. Um, the, uh, so I think that there, um, it, it's really important. So if you really think about it, the, um, you know, if you're talking about the amount of power it takes to operate a data center, um, you know, heating, uh, you know, cooling a data center is sort of the biggest problem. And, um, uh, yeah, that takes up a lot of the energy. The machines themselves use a lot of energy, but then you have to cool them down. And especially using, um, you know, accelerators like GPUs, the modern GPUs, I mean, they'll heat your house. One will heat your house. Uh, they, they really, um, you know, put off a lot of, they use a lot of power and they uh, put off a lot of heat. So, um, you know, there's been some really interesting uh, divergences in uh, how to cool data centers as a result. Um, and, you know, I, I, uh, I live in Austin, Texas. I'm here right now. Yesterday was 110 degrees here. Um, and the power, you may have seen in the news, the Texas power grid is having problems. Well, what does that do to your data centers? It does a lot to them. Um, and, you know, some of the data centers here, uh, like TAC, for instance, um, you know, they created a more green way of cooling their, you know, 20 megawatt uh, data center, which is, you know, to have a giant, giant 60,000 gallon tank of water that's cooled at night and the towers are off during the day and that, that that sort of keeps it going. So I think there's a lot of ways to do it. Um, older data centers kind of are a big problem. Um, you know, if people have their own data centers um, that uh, that it really they'd essentially have to knock the building down and rebuild it to to uh, make it more efficient. Uh, that's that's a problem that we've seen some of our customers facing too. So it is a problem, and you know, you know, that's something you don't have to deal with as much in the cloud, right? Is is that they kind of take care of that stuff? 
Um, and so it's less of a concern. Um, but when we're talking about cost um, comparisons here, we are talking about total cost of ownership, uh, which includes that. It includes power, uh, cooling, um, you know, uh, facilities and maintenance. And <clears throat> even with all that, uh, depending on how you're using the cloud, it can be more expensive. Yeah, and I've definitely heard of, you know, newer cloud, cloud providers emerging that are specializing in sort of liquid and immersion cooling, right, and trying to figure out new ways of, of cooling their data center and, and then providing it to you as a cloud service. So very interesting. Um, <clears throat> okay, we've got, um, how about, what are your thoughts about analytics platforms such as Databricks and DataRobot that often run on cloud and can make cloud-based analysis more friendly to end users? Uh, I'm sorry, say that again? Uh, what are your thoughts on analytics platforms. So Databricks or DataRobot that kind of run in the cloud but can make cloud-based analysis, you know, more user-friendly. Yeah, so I think actually those are key. Um, you know, without naming any of them, I, I, I said that, you know, if, if, if IT, uh, your organization thinks, you know, giving you the keys to a cloud is going to fix your problems, it's not. But those platforms are going to start because they take care of a lot of that underlying architecture problem for you. Um, you know, they've already built out, uh, you know, uh, uh, the systems, the interfaces, uh, uh, you know, the data models, all those things um, uh, uh, for you. And so it's much, much more ready for the end users to start working. And so, um, you know, I, they bring you a long way. Um, and I think depending on the state of your organization, meaning how many people you have uh, that, that need to use this, the degree of, of utilization that you need, uh, meaning, you know, do you have 12 researchers, um, you know, who are generating a reasonable amount of data um, that, that can easily fit within the subscription model of these services? Yeah, totally. I think, I think that's great. Do you have 8,000 scientists who are generating, you know, uh, two petabytes of data a day uh, that, that need to use, on average, um, you know, 40,000 compute cores a day? Um, probably going to be a stretch on on that model. Uh, you probably need something a little more sophisticated. So, uh, or or maybe a combination of things. Actually, you know, because because a lot of those uh, a lot of those systems you know work great for organizing uh, data, um, and then you can you can interface with them and uh, and pull it out into other systems uh, to do uh, deeper, more sophisticated analysis. So, I think those are great. Um, you know, and we we run into them all the time in in really good ways. So we've got a couple of questions about security of the cloud. You know, how do you deal with security in the cloud? <clears throat> data protection, security measures. Anything to say there? Ooh, I think that's a whole other talk. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, security is uh, it's it's challenging in any environment right now. Um, <clears throat> I think a lot of times, uh, you know, because of the legalities around um, around security. Uh, specifically, um, because of, you know, if there's a security breach, the first had to roll or the security officers, um, and, uh, you know, and, and it, it's a big business, uh, honestly, um, you know, a lot of organizations uh, start with security before considering what their applications are. And that's a mistake. That's, that's something that we have run into for the entire time that I've been at, at, at Bioteam, again, 10 years. Um, and, you know, the, the, the challenge there is that um, if you do security first, what you're doing is limiting uh, uh, the amount of scientific data that can get through it because security always slows things down every time. Uh, there are ways to do security, uh, more modern ways to do security that are harder. It's not, you know, to quote my, my friend Eli Dart from, uh, uh, from DOE, um, you know, because you have a box with the word uh, firewall six screen on the side, on the side does not mean that you're being efficient and or secure. It's how you use it and how it's implemented uh, that matters. And so, um, in general, there's there's sort of this problem with security. Um, now, the clouds, if you use them right, are probably more secure than anything you could build, um, you know, because uh, they use very sophisticated abstraction virtual models. Um, a along with very, very cool hardware that they, a lot of times they've come up with um, uh, to, to apply these, these things. And, you know, really per account or per organization or even per instance, you can set up various uh, uh, security rules in all of the clouds that are super, super effective. But you really have to think about how you're using it because 
you can make it so that um, you know you've got it so secure that you can trickle data in at you know one megabit per second, uh, and that's going to screw everything up. Uh, it's, uh, or or you made it so secure that no one can actually use it. Um, you know we've done that before. Or you made it so insecure that everyone can get to it, and that's not good either. So um, you know the, the models are quite different, and the application is quite different, and so you have to be really really careful with it. And um, the inheritance of those security features change. How, you know, depending on your identity and access management settings in clouds and which cloud you're using. So um, I would, uh, I would, you know, watch some YouTube videos or, or hire some experts to help you with that because it, it does not work like, you know, quite like a firewall. Um, and it doesn't work like, uh, like local security equipment. Awesome. Okay. <clears throat> we have time for just a couple more. Yeah, that was great. Right. Yep. Um, so I like this one. So in grant funded research, unpredictable expenses are problematic and accidental overspend can be disastrous. So I'm aware of a case where one line error in analytical code generated a $1.5 million bill in unexpected cloud charges. So cloud providers really don't provide uh, solutions for cost containment. Are you aware of cloud environments that provide true cost containment? <laughs> that is a great question. And it is a, you know, it's it's kind of the, the the doomsday example of what can happen if you uh, don't rate limit things. For instance, you know, uh, heard of <laughs> a, a very similar anecdote years ago from uh, from NCBI. Something similar happened. They were pulling data back from Glacier, um, and uh, they forgot to rate limit it to the free tier, and they pulled it all back at once, and they got this huge bill from them uh, as as a result. And um, so. The clouds themselves, they do have budget alarms, I think, you know, and Adam, you can help me with yep. this. Um, <clears throat> yeah. But yeah, go ahead. AWS, so AWS does support, you know, budget alarms and alerts and kind of requires you to monitor your budgets and take action. I will say Azure uh, implements uh, quotas, right? And will actually yep. stop people from launching instances and doing things when they hit quotas. I think GCP might have a similar thing for, for project budgets, but it does require a new le level of oversight for sure. And yeah, um, yeah and, you know, cloud economics are complicated. Um, I think someone else, you know, uh, mentioned other things related to cost. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and, you know, the, the, the there are, there are, um, providers that operate on clouds that help to provide, you know, guardrails, um, uh, to those, uh, to those particular, um, uh, problems, <clears throat> but, but it points out one of the fundamental issues with clouds. One of the complicated points is that, they're not there um, to help you uh, necessarily limit your your budget. They're there to provide you a service. <clears throat> it's your job to use the service correctly, um, and it's your job to understand the impact of what's <clears throat> happening. And if you uh, you know have people coding and they're testing things, and you know they forget to put that uh, that that sleep uh, uh, stanza in their in their code, and it just goes nuts. The cloud's going to let you go nuts because they they they're going to assume that's what you want to do. Um, versus uh, the other way around. So um, it, you kind of have to think ahead on those things. And this is one of the great reasons to have uh, test environments. Um, and so, uh, yeah, because then you can really rate limit stuff on that in case things like that happen. Okay, I think we're at time. So. Yes, thanks everyone. Um, so just before you go, I just wanted to quickly sort of share uh, the next couple of uh, webinars we have coming up. So uh, this was today. And again, the recording and the slides will be available. Um, coming up in about two weeks, we have Dr. Laura Boykin uh, talking about building a global data environment for decentralized scientific research. Uh, so please register for that. I think you know um, Laura is a TED fellow and this is definitely a talk you do not wanna miss. Um, so that's in about two weeks. Um, and then following on that, we've had we've a couple of webinars from uh, one of our co-founders, Chris Dagigian, who's gonna be talking you know, parallel cluster tips and tricks, lessons learned. Uh, if you're really, if you're interested in doing HPC in the cloud, in particular in AWS, um, we found parallel cluster to be a really successful way to do that. Chris is going to share some sort of in the trenches tips and tricks there. And then following up on that, you know, how to actually take that a step further and you know use commercial software like the Schrodinger suite and do you know license aware Schrodinger integration with parallel cluster. So you know using GPUs and dealing with sort of license management in a in a cloud HPC application. Uh, so please register for those and uh, you can find all these on our website. Awesome. Thank you all very much. That's it. Yep. Thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your day and uh, reach out to us if you have any other questions. Thanks so much, everybody. Cheers. Cheers.